Hello, everyone, and happy WikiTree Day to you. Um, the WikiTree Day is almost over, but we still have a few hours left of workshops and sessions to go through. So um, I'm hoping you're having a great day. There have been some wonderful presentations today already. And uh, stay tuned because there's some more coming up. But for this hour, you're, you've chosen to spend the time with me. And uh, hello to everyone who's there in the chat live. And welcome to everyone who's watching this after the fact um, on YouTube. So my name is Greg Clark. I'm a Wikitree member. Uh, I'm an app developer. And I'm also a retired math and computer science teacher. And anyone who's watched any of the live casts I've been part of, you might know that I, I do love math and I love numbers. And um, I'm often doing stats during the, the THON events. And so I thought it'd be kind of neat to share uh, my love of math and genealogy with you all. So that is the focus for this next hour with me here. So I'm hoping you, you'll enjoy it. Uh, I'll enjoy having you guys around along for the ride. Um, so first of all, this uh, presentation, uh, in genealogy and math, where two passions meet is what I've called it. I've actually first presented this uh, this past April as part of the Provincial Math Association's annual conference in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, I'm a retired math teacher, as I said, and I'm also the webmaster for the OAME, which is the Association for Math Teachers. And we have an annual conference, and this was the first conference we actually had face-to-face -face after the pandemic. And so I offered this, this workshop. And at that workshop, the focus was um, teaching teacher, te uh, math teachers how their past, uh, their their passion or their pastime or their hobby could influence. You could use that to embed math uh, examples of math. And um, but we'll be doing the same. We'll be talking about a lot of the same uh, topics, um, but sort of from the opposite point of view. You guys already know the genealogy. What you may not be aware of is the mathematics behind that, whereas they knew the mathematics, but they didn't realize the genealogy connection to it. So it's great. And since both I'm uh, I love both genealogy and mathematics, it makes perfect sense. So um, the and these are the, the sort of the two quotes that I started the presentation with off in, in April in Toronto, which are still still true. Math is everywhere and something we as teachers often tell our students but have you considered how connected it all is? So you're going to join me as I explore those two things. Now, one of the things that I often do um, on the live cast or when I'm doing the stats is a lot of number play and stuff. We won't be talking about so much number play. We'll actually be talking about math, some actual mathematics. But don't worry about that because, you know, I will we'll explain it as we go along. And if there's some part that's a, a little wild out there, it's been a while. Um, don't just worry. Uh, don't worry. The next slide will be a little bit easier. We'll see. Um, so there's lots of con uh, uh, similarities between genealogy and mathematics, and I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much because they're both really about finding meaning in things, finding meaning in numbers and contexts, and making sense of the real world is all of, is what math is all about, really. And genealogy is about finding meaning in your family and. Uh, relationships, making connections with each other, um, discoveries and processes that you use to build on, you know, your math skill, your math skills, just like you, um, your processes and discoveries on how you research the research skills you build. Um, both of them, <laughs> if you dive into a rabbit hole in genealogy, it really is like a jigsaw puzzle trying to put things together. And uh, a good math problem is the same sort of thing. And just like in math, you have to show your work to get the full marks on a test. In genealogy, on Wikitree, you have to show your work. You have to cite those sources. So there's so many parallels. It's just uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, so we'll start off simple. Um, if you're building a family tree, and uh, all the examples I've used today, or almost all the examples, come straight from Wikitree. Um, in the example that in the uh, I'm going to turn off that little logo there for a sec. Um, uh, in the actual presentation I get, I did um, uh, for the math teachers, um, I used examples from all over, including WikiTree. But I've uh, changed some of the slides so that uh, we have mostly WikiTree left. Um, but um, a very simple application of mathematics is 
when you look at a family tree is just counting the relatives, sorting relatives, comparing ages. And you may think that counting is that's pretty basic stuff. Sorting numbers, that's pretty straightforward. And it is straightforward, but it's also important. Um, as math teachers, uh, it would be I'd be remiss if I didn't stress the importance of all those really simple number sense skills that we learn early on and, and take for granted as we go through. But the the concepts that we learn about adding numbers together in grade grade one or two are the same concepts that are applied, but at different levels when you're adding uh, adding variables and when you're doing algebra or adding uh, fractions or percents, all those sorts of things. So the concepts build on each other. So those simple skills that we learn um, are important. And categorization, sorting, all of those things. So these types of questions along the side there are ones that you could answer by looking at the family chart there. Now, uh, the first question, how many Anns are there in this family tree? You might wonder why I chose Ann. And the reason is uh, because this profile is the profile of Lucy Maud Montgomery, who's one of the most famous uh, uh, Canadian authors. She's the one who authored the Anne of Green Gables series of books. And uh, you don't have to be Canadian to appreciate Anne of Green Gables. Uh, I think many people would recognize Anne of Green Gables. So, uh, that hence the how many Anne's and you can see actually there, there's a few Anne's in her uh Anne Murray was her grandmother uh there was Lucy Ann Wolner was her other grandmother Sarah Ann Kemp so there's a number of Anne's in her uh lineage so it's possible that she her main character was was born out of her uh one of her ancestors and of course all those other questions are ones that can be Analy uh, can be answered by analyzing the chart. Yay, Anne, I see that. Oh, and look at and there was an Anne who said that. Way to go. Um, if you do have questions, you can always put the questions in the chat. Um, I may or may not notice them as I'm going along. But I'll try to keep an eye on them from time to time. And uh, yes, Anne with an E, that was a wonderful sh show. Um, you're making me digress. Maybe I shouldn't be looking at the chat as I go through this. Um, but some of these questions, I mean, some of these questions can be analyzed uh, analytically and mathematically by counting or sorting. Some of them are ones that are more open-ended, like why are there unknowns? What are these unknowns about? And if you think of it from a, a math teacher's point of view, they think, oh, why is that unknown? But of course, as genealogists, we know those unknowns are brick, brick walls, either brick walls or the place where this wiki tree um, just ran out of steam. So one or the other, who knows? So maybe some other wiki treaters could look up Lucy Maud Montgomery's uh, uh, profile in WikiTree and fill out this so that she has a full five generation chart all the way up. Be nice if anyone's willing to take that on. Suffolk, England, uh, do the records go before 1787, one wonders? Okay, just throwing it out there for you. Um, this is the same sort of, this is the same family tree different app and this is from the tree app the couples uh, the couples dynamic tree and this one uh has the not only has the the parents at each generation but it also has a drop down list so you can actually show the children and i've done that and so the question is how many people are listed here when you just have the parents then it's a quick you can count by twos two four six eight ten twelve um people but once you add the children, then you have to do a little bit more mental math as you're adding through it. So that's another skill that people develop over time. And children should learn in school. Um, and, are, and it's something that actually takes a little practice to get good at and to stay sharp at. But um, the another way of organizing your ancestors, besides just a straight pedigree chart, is what's called an Onentoffel ancestor list. So basically, it's a, it's a table. The Toffel means table. Um, of your of the old of the ancestor the on and on and toffel hence that's the name and so what it does is it starts at the primary person and for this one i chose uh Henri morris morris rocket richard very famous montreal canadian hockey player from canada um so he's the primary person at generation number one and then his parents are in this next generation and then grandparents are the ones under that and so there you just number them starting at one and going down sequentially and then the fourth generation would be the great grandparents. 
when you look at the and the way that's organized, um, you can, if you count the number of people at every generation, there's another mathematical sequence right there. One person in generation one, two people in generation two, four people in generation three, eight people. So you just double the number of people every generation, which makes sense, right? As genealogists, you know that every person has two parents. And if we have a full, um, if we have a full pedigree, then you're, that's the pattern that's always going to happen. But another part of the pattern that you may not uh, recognize immediately is because of the way the numbering system works, every even number is going to be a male, a, one of the, a father, grandfather, great grandfather. So we have Onesim, Henri, Charles, Onesim again, Alexandre, Octave, Isidore. Now these are French names, so you may not recognize them as being male, specifically male names, if you're not uh, used to French, um, uh, French genealogy. But trust me, those are male names. Uh, and so the odd one, the ones I haven't circled, are obviously all the the females, the the mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers. The same numbering system can also be displayed on a fan chart. And so in the fan chart, one of the options is. Uh, and it's on the general general tab under uh, option settings, is to show the on and toffel number. And it lo looks like this. Now, I've customized this one for this slide so that it show it's a, it's in a much larger font. Um, so I did that little tweaking personally. That's not when you do it, it will show it'll be just actually it'll be the same font as underneath. The name there and it won't be bold so it's it's not it doesn't take over the fan chart because that maybe isn't very um lovely to look at but for what we're going to do we want to see if there's a if, see the patterning here so i want it to be nice and big and loud for you so the pattern if you look at the numbering uh the on and toffle numbering so there's one there's rocket richard um and there's his parents Onesim and Marie Alice, and then his grandparents, Henri, Justine, Charles, and Seraphine. Uh, and so you can see the counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But what's kind of neat is that to get anyone's dad, you take their number, which we'll call N, and you just multiply it by two. So his father is number two. His grandfather then, his father's father, is two times two, which is four. If we take uh, Matilda over here, she's number 13. Her father would be 2 times 13, which is 26, which is right there. And likewise, to find the mother, you just go 2 times the number and then add 1. So isn't that cool? Isn't that really neat how to get that? Um, so the one that's highlighted here, Sophia Lapierre, to get to her, we would start at uh, uh, Maurice Richard. So that's he's number 1. And it's on her father's on his father's side, so times two, but then it's up the grandmother, so times two plus one gives you the five, and then her mother times two plus one, and then her mother is Sophie Lapierre, so times two twenty two plus one. Isn't that neat? I think that's I think that's a pretty cool pattern. So, um, what else can we do? So here's another pedigree chart. And this one is taken using the Ancestor Lines Explorer app. This is a very cool app. And what's really neat about this is um, now these are all slides. So because I wanted this uh, presentation to flow smoothly and for you not have to wait as I load one tree app after the other, um, this these are <laughs> this slide is not interactive. But the cool thing about this app is that if you click on any of these nodes, then you'll either open or close the information. So if I, I were to click, sorry, here. If I were to click on Louis Marcou right now, then the the nodes that are to the right of him, so that would be Charles Angelique and their children, and their, not children, going parents, right? Charles Angelique and their parents, that they would all collapse. Um, likewise, um, or conversely, if we were to, uh, click on the node here for Joseph Amable Daoud, then uh, it would open up and show Joseph's uh, father and mother. So it's a very fluid and the, the animation is very cool looking. So it's kind of a neat, a neat app uh, in that regard. But we can use this to show that, you know, looking at this, you automatically see powers of two 
Um, but also we can talk about the exponential functions. So at generation one, in this case, I'm using Joseph as generation zero. So at generation one, the parents, uh, we have two people. And two to the power of one is two. So that's kind of neat. At the second generation, where the grandparents are, there are four. And two squared, or two to the power of two, is four. And likewise, at the third generation, two cubed is eight people. Two to the fourth is 16 people. And isn't that neat? Now, what if we went back? Like, I said that Joseph is in um, generation zero. And that makes sense, because if we look at it here, we're going, if we just count backwards, four, three, two, one, well, it has to be zero, right? That's the next one. And the nice thing about mathematics and it, how it's structured so logically is that two to the zero is equal to one. Uh, because mathematicians have agreed that anything to the power zero is always one. Cool, eh? Uh, and we could get even geekier and there's a formula. If we want to calculate all the people at n generations from the beginning, from number one, from Joseph up to whatever n, then there's a little formula here, two to the n plus one minus one. So if we wanted to calculate all the people we see in here at four generations, we would just go two to the exponent four plus one, which is five minus one. So two to the exponent five, which is 32 minus one. So that 31 people are in this pedigree chart. Cool. Never saw the multipliers before. There you go. Thanks, Steve. Um, now, there's this is another tree app. This is the fractal tree app, actually, that, that I created. And there's lots of different things that we could do with this. One of the neat th applications of this would be about area and estimation. So uh, a question you might have is, how much paper would you actually need to display this chart? And you could ask that um, in a number of different ways. And you could, now what if we just wanted to display the name tags um, for each of the people? So just Williams, David's, like just the name tags, not the, the whole sheet sort of thing. Um, and what if we went back another generation? And so it had to be bigger. So those types of area and estimation questions are ones that just naturally pop out when you look at a, a chart like this. Another thing, that uh, this type of display opens up, the mathematics that are inherent in it is, how do you plot each of those? So if you were programming it, like I had to program it, how would you do that? Well, the e most logical thing would be to set this up on a grid and to think of this as the plotting it on the Cartesian plane. And that's basically what I did. And I had to figure out a formula that would take each person and plot them on the grid. And when I did that, uh, you would get, so if I wanted to find out where Josephine Dumont was, she's right there, she would be basically at position three, one. So over three and up one. Whereas Margaret Overland over here is back two and down two, or at position negative two, negative two on the X, Y axis. And if you wanted to really know the, the deep, um the deep dive the, the way i the formulas that we you i use to create the find those x and y's actually are based on their on and toffle numbers because the on and toffle numbers are unique for everyone and remember we we show, showed you that earlier you know it starts at one for the person in the middle and this is my um my pedigree my family my fractal chart actually so i'm the guy in the monkey in the middle um so i'm one and then my father would be two, my mother would be three, and then so on, four and five and six and seven and so on. Now, that exi exact same pedigree chart could be displayed using a fan chart. We all love fan charts, right? So um, the same question could be asked. How do you plot these people on the fan chart? And now you've already seen the on, the on and toffle numbers superimposed on the fan chart, and I did use those to calculate it, but what, what's the formula look like? Well, this is actually the two lines in my programming code that actually calculates the X and the Y coordinate for every person in this fan chart. So isn't that neat? Well, if you think that's neat, it's gonna get neater because I'm gonna show you how I came up with that because the secret is trigonometry. So hands up all those who love trigonometry in high school. 
oh, I can't see your hands, of course, because I don't have video for all of you. But you could always say in the chat, you know, I love Trig. Um, and some of you may think, uh, I learned Trig, but there was no real use, no application. Why would I be learning? You probably asked yourself, why am I learning this stuff in school? Well, this is one reason why you're learning it, because if I hadn't learned Trig, I wouldn't have been able to program the fan chart for you. And, you know, wouldn't you be sad at that point? Uh-huh. Cosine and tan. Yes, Steve Steve remembers trig. <laughs> so, yes, the secret to this is the lovely triangle. And if you draw a right-angle triangle here, so I'm going to try and find the coordinates for Marie Eugenie Alphonse La Bonté. So she is my uh, great-grandmother. And so one of my great-grandmothers. Uh, so you see, if I by drawing the triangle like this, I'd have to go from, if I'm the origin at the center of this circle, then I'd have to go over X pixels and up Y pixels. And then this H here is sort of like the radius, right? That H pixels, that's the hypotenuse. So if you might remember the hypotenuse is a special term, a special side in a right angle triangle. Um, uh, and you might remember the formula that was misquoted in the, in the Wizard of Oz movie. Um, but x squared plus y squared actually equals h squared. So, you know, um, and that was another thing you, you might have learned. But the other thing is the sine, cosine, and tangent, which are all part of trigonometry. And for this, we're going to use the cosine uh, because the cosine is related to the x coordinate. Cosine uh, is the cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which in this case is the, um, the x over the h value here. And if the sine is the y value over the h, y over h, so there's your sine and cosine. If we go a little deeper, um, there's the cosine, x over h. We just rearrange that equation a bit, and we get x all by itself, which is what we need. We need to know x all by itself, and we'll eventually need to know y all by it itself. Um, and in fact, but that h, what does that h represent? Well, if you start at the first circle, the first circle that goes through my parents, Dwight and Pauline, um, and then you look, compare that to the circle that goes through my grandparents, uh, and then the circle that goes through my great-grandparents, um, all of those circles basically are, they start at that initial radius, and then you just so basically you double the radius, or you make it three times the radius. So every time you go out one generation, it gets one radius more. So basically, the h in the right angle triangle is the radius depending on the generation level you're at. So if we know the number of generations, we just have to multiply that by the initial, the, the small radius in the beginning, in the middle of the circle, and then we have our we have our full formula. So basically, that's where you get this information here. So the number of generations times the radius, that's the h. In the cosine of whatever angle we're at, so this is theta, the placement angle, uh, you have to multiply by pi and divide by 180 because computers don't talk in degrees, they talk in something called radians, and that's the the, the conversion factor for radians. So um, you may you probably didn't you may not have um, learned about that the computerized, but you may have if you take an advanced trig course know about radians versus degrees and stuff, but and that's where that part would come in. So isn't that cool? So you guys all know the secrets, the secret sauce behind the fan fan chart. So aren't you glad you came? I hope you are. Let's move on to let's some more math. So now, if we switch from drawing charts and pedigrees and, and that sort of thing, let's look at some DNA because there's lots of math in DNA. And the cool thing about math in DNA is that, uh, <laughs> yes, there are radians on the graph and calculator. <laughs> Um, the cool thing about DNA, I'm getting distracted by this, the chat, um, is that it's all based on randomness. So this, you probably didn't study a lot about random numbers uh, or random number theory in high school. You may have studied it uh, if you started chaos theory or fractals uh, at a higher level course, but um, there's some cool stuff that goes on there. So let's look at the... Um, Let's look at the X chromosome because the X chromosome is kind of neat because it acts really peculiar um, compared to all the other chromosomes, which are just boring, right? The X chromosome um, is one of the two um, uh, 
one of the two possibilities in chromosome number 23, and that's the one that determines uh, your gender at birth, your sex at birth. So males have an X and a Y chromosome. Uh, females have two X chromosomes. And the X chromosome gets passed on. Every person has at least one, and women have, have two. So the dad gives an X chromosome to his, his daughters and gives a Y chromosome to his boys, to his sons. Mom gives uh, an X chromosome to both of her children, or all, all of her children, I should say. So that's how, that's how it gets uh, distributed. And the X Friends app on Wikitree uh, is one that can be used to demonstrate how the X chromosome is distributed and also then used in reverse to find other cousins who could share some of the same X chromosome as you. So if we look at this, the beginning of this X chromosome family tree, which uh, once you've loaded um, your family tree up on the X Friends app, uh, you get presented with this X chromosome family tree. And so we'll start, this is me at the bottom <laughs> again. So being a male, I only re I received my X chromosome from my mother, Pauline, and she received her X chromosome, one from her father, Joseph Eli, and you see that she had an exact duplicate of his X chromosome. So you see the blue, blue, red, orange, orange, that's what she has here. That's the her X chromosome that she got identically from her father. Then she got an X chromosome from her mother, which is a combination of the two X chromosomes that her mother had. So you can see um, there's some of that teal, some magenta and some lime in half of hers. And then there's some dark green and some pink in the other half. And then that continue, that pattern continues back. Um, my grandfather received an X combination of X chromosomes from his, his mother. And my grandmother received a next chromosome from her father and a combination from her mother and so on. Now, that is how, that is the, my X chromosome family tree. So at the fifth level, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight possible ancestors who gave me part of my, what would become my X chromosome. Now, and we're going to talk about the, that possibility, that word possible uh, in a sec. But if we just count the number of people at each generation, so at the bottom, at me, there's one of me, there's one of my mother, there's two of my grandparents, three great grandparents, five great great and eight great 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 grandparents. And that number, do you see that number pattern? One, one, two, three, five, eight, or one plus one is two, one plus two is three, two plus three is five, three plus five is eight. Those who listen to my stats on the recent thon will know that that is the Fibonacci sequence. Isn't that cool? Fibonacci, Fibonacci lives. Um, so that's, that's one really cool thing about the X chromosome inheritance pattern is it makes us, it follows the Fibonacci sequence, just like a lot of things in nature, you know, spirals around a starfish and a whole bunch of other things or sunflower. Um, now back to those other boring uh, chromosomes, one to twenty-two. Um, again, that when they combine, they combine randomly. Uh, so just uh, uh, so your dad had two chromosomes. One, um, well, it doesn't matter which chromosome number this is. We'll just say this is chromosome seven, just for for funs, funsies. Uh, so he got uh, a blue one from Gramps and a green one from Grandma, and then passing that on to me, he would have, or to, um, uh, it's a combination of the blue and the green. And so the, where the blue turns to green and the green turns to blue, those are called recombination points, basically. And that, comb that switching from one color to another happens during the meiosis stage, which you may have also studied in biology. Um, which is an application of mathematics. So there you go. And likewise, for, mom got uh, pink from her granddad and orange from her grandmama. And uh, that may be what, ha what hers look like. And then you mix those together. So those, that's what you received. And then when you passed on your, your a, a chromosome, doesn't matter, it does not the X chromosome, but any chromosome, uh, and it combines, you could have combined you could have passed on something that looks like this. So a little bit of blue, some some magenta, some blue, some orange, some green, and some magenta. So it just could be a combination. And in this case, if you were to do, uh, you can't see, I'm holding up a pencil here. 
where the combination, but you can imagine where the combination recombination points are. So that's just an example of how recombination happens. And of course, your child would have received another one equally as messed, uh, mixed up, not messed up, messed up's the wrong word, um, from another parent. But again, just randomness. So uh, another app that's on a tree app is the X Family Tree app. And basically, it's, it's not as fulsome as the X Friends app. The <laughs> I like, okay, Vicky, I just saw this and I do like that. Fibonacci should be my biscuits. Yes. So, <laughs> so instead of typing biscuits in when someone arrives, they should just type in Fibonacci. I like it. <laughs> okay. Um, where was I? You're distracting me, folks. But uh, uh, here we are. So the I showed you the a screenshot from the X Friends app and what it does um, which I didn't go into, and you can you can explore that uh, a little bit later if you'd like. Um, after it gives you your X chromosome family tree, then there are two other tabs where you can investigate cousins who also have shared, uh, who are in the chromosome path for those ancestors, who um, you share some of those ancestors, but maybe not necessarily all, but some of those cousins may also share some of your X chromosome. Um, so you can follow up that with DNA matching and stuff like that. But the X family tree, all it does is creates the chromosome tree. It doesn't doesn't go deeper in finding cousins, but it's it's a neat app to uh, to be used to explore. So that first slide, let me just go back. A, can I go back a slide? Uh, come on. Uh, do, do, um, I should be able to go back a slide, right? There we go. That first slide is a pro, what I call the probability tree, and so as when it goes from one person to the next. Um, you'll see that, so for example, uh, going from all in the top left here, going from Marie Philomène Morin down to Joseph Desaret, La Bonté, you'll see, I don't know if you can tell on YouTube whether, um, but her green, her two green chromosomes, uh, one's a darker green and one's a little bit lighter. And you can see the split in the middle. So the lighter, there's half is lighter and half is, is darker. And then when we combine those for the next level, we get half is this teal, half are those two shades of pink, and then this other one. So basically at each level, um, the amount of X chromosome that's passed on from one parent to the next when it's recombined is halved. And that's assuming that at every recombination, a full recombination happens and it gives exactly 50%. But we know that the recombination actually is random. So it's not always going to be 50%. Um, so this is only basically a guess. It's a problem. It's a, it's the best guess because we have no idea where, what's really going to happen. Um, so this is the best guess. And in some cases, this, uh, you could think of this as the best case. Um, because in this, if you look at my, uh, result down there, I've got a little piece of every one of those eight possible ancestors that I could have received an X chromosome from. Now, in reality, that doesn't always happen. And probably I could, um, you would probably say that it, uh, it probably rarely happens you get uh, a, a piece of every single one of those ancestors. And the farther back you go, it's almost definite that you won't receive the piece of, of X chromosome from every one of the potential ancestors that you um, inherit from. So that's why I created a second option. So there's a button in the X chromosome, um, and the X family tree app that goes from probability simulation to random simulation. And then the random simulation, I've drawn in those recombination points. So if you look again at the, uh, in the top left, you can see those three lines that drop down. Those are the recombination points. And those are the points underneath, underneath. You can see where the light green turns to dark green and then back to light green and then back to dark green. And you'll notice that there are times when there is one recombination point. Sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three. You could possibly have four and you could have a scenario where there's none, where you don't get any, uh, where you get um, where the mother passes on her full top chromosome, which, which she might've got from her father or her, her full bottom chromosome, which she could have got from her mother. So, there, so that happens sometimes as well. So here you can see in this one, this random example, uh, there is, I believe there is no dark green 
from Marie Philomène in this random example. If I do another random example, you'll see in this one, there's no blue at all. And so here's comparing all three of those examples. And you can see there, you get wildly different combinations, possible combinations, um, which just sort of demonstrates the randomness of how the X chromosome is distributed. But the same sort of principle applies to all of the chromosomes, um, that it's all, you know, there's a lot of randomness, which is, I think, is a very cool mathematical principle, which is very cool. Um, let's go on. Uh, there's lots of things about probability and percent. And this, this is from the DNA Painter website, Johnny Pearl's um, website, and it is amazing. And I could spend the rest of this, this night talking about all the great math in here, um, so I'm not going to because we don't have all the rest of tonight. But I encourage you strongly, if you've done, if you do much work in DNA, then you'll probably be familiar with this, but there's, there's some, there's some, there's histograms, there's bell, uh, by, uh, bell, bell grass, um, percentage, there's so much here, but I'm just going to leave this for now and walk away. But uh, this is another a uh, lovely area where there's so much math and um, he's done a wonderful job. He's, he's a genius having programmed this site. It's wonderful. Um, now, we go, <laughs> this is very cool. Now we're getting in, um, you might want to hold on to your hats here because we're getting into some really cool math. Um, uh, this, whoopsie, let me go back. Ah, go back to that picture there. So this is this graphic here is taken from the Haplo subtree uh, SNP Tree Explorer, which is from Scaled Innovation, uh, which is um, a site uh, which links links from the mitoydna.org site, access from the one of the tools on that site, the YSTR Plus tool. Now, mitoydna is is one of, is a site where you can upload your YDNA data or your mitochondrial data and it's uh, it's a it's a free database it's 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 free to access to create a login and and use it and it's it's sort of like how gedmatch is a place where you can upload your autosomal dna like the dna that you get from ancestry my heritage family tree dna 23andme that sort of thing and compare it with people from who have tested at other companies it's the same principle but for specifically y dna and mito mito y uh, mitochondrial dna and on that site, when you investigate a, a, a kit, uh, there are a number of additional tools. And just like with GEDmatch, when you uh, on Wikitree, when you go to the place where you add information about your DNA kits, uh, you can add your your Mito Y DNA ID so that people can link to that. If you have a if you match with someone else, they can link to your Mito Y DNA and compare with with their results. Um, so, uh, they, anyway, so this is one of the, this is a, a link from one of the tools that's on that Mito Y DNA. And what this is, uh, basically what this is showing me. So our FT8806, that is my, um, that is my Mito, my haplogroup right here. And this one here, our FT3815569 is another haplogroup that's re related to me. It's a got the, the people in the first one have the last name Douglas, which was my biological uh, birth name. And there's another cousin, Douglas cousin, who's in that group. This is a different last name, um, the people who are in this group. But you can see that we branch off at, and just before the 1400, so this this line here, 1500, that means the 1500 AD or in the current, current era. So, both of these, um, both of these endpoints are in are in the current area. In fact, um, our common ancestor here was born in 1800, um, and their common ancestor is born a little bit after 1800. Our where our two groups merge is a little bit before that in I don't know about 1350. It looks like so that's a little bit before we there's a lot of reliable records but you know it'd be really cool if we actually could find where these two groups merge so we'll see if there's if we have some more testers we may be able to 
zoom in on that. And then this group, um, I had done a comparison with those two uh, plus a third one. This group, this person here is from way is is very very like super distantly like almost not related you know realistically speaking to me at all because our common ancestor with this person is way back way bc <laughs> but this the mathematics behind estimating where to place these these markers on the time scale um is some pretty heavy level math and uh our good friend peter roberts who is part of the DNA team on Wikitree and uh, a very reliable and brilliant genealogist and DNA expert, uh, showed me this article that was written in a, in a journal, The Improved Models of Coalescence Ages of Why DNA Haplogroups by Ian McDonald. Um, and there's the link to his uh, to the article if you want to read it. It's pretty heavy, uh, high level math. But I just wanted to, I pulled out this beautiful equation because isn't that cool looking that is so neat um and the way you would read that equation if you wanted to is the probability of a time given an event is equal to the uh, k which is a multiplier a constant multiplier times the product um as i goes from one to n of the probability of that time with all the sub events e sub i isn't that neat and if uh, I could go into more detail, um, and actually in uh, at a subsequent conference, I did go into some more detail. So I explained that the the capital, what looks like sort of arches there is actually a capital letter, letter pi, you know, pi, the diameter of, a, you know, which is related to the diameter of a circle. But that's what a capital pi looks like. As a, you're used to seeing sort of the wavy one with the two, two legs, that's a small letter pi, by the way. But um, you may you may not have seen equations with the capital pi, but you probably saw you may have seen equations with the capital sigma here. That little that angry e is what I what my, my students often called it the angry e. Um, and what that means is you add a bunch of things. And so uh, if you were looking at this equation, the way to decode that is i goes from one to four. So you take this formula put in one, you get one squared, you put in two, you get two squared, three squared, four squared. And then the, the angry E, that's a capital S or sigma, capital sigma. And so you sum them together or add them together. So you get one plus four plus nine plus 16, which gives you 30. So that's how you would decode that formula. Well, a pi, uh, capital pi, um, is used for product, it's for multiplying. So you just multiply all these things together. And so that, that's how you would use that formula. And the cool, it gets even cooler because that K, that constant, that the way to find the constant is you have to take an integral. And so we, um, so we get to use some calculus. Um, and the integral is gonna be, you set the equal, integral equal to one, and that gives you the area under the curve, which is 100%. Anyways, I will stop there, but there's some really cool high level math when we get to the stage. But let's take it back, okay? <laughs> take a breath. Um, and I'll show you one more example of some, some math and genealogy. Um, we've done, I mean, we, we did some charts, we did some family tree building, we did some DNA, we went into Y DNA and some other really cool stuff. Um, but there's math even in, in just writing a simple biography and finding some, some simple sources. So here's an example of an Irish uh, an Irish profile that I worked on for uh, some friends. And it talks about Martin, who was born in 1804, and he lived in Ireland. And in 1850, uh, there was something that was called the Griffiths Valuation. So someone went around to all the places in Ireland and wrote down um, who lived on what pieces of land and how much, uh, basically, uh, what was on the land, uh, what buildings were on the land, the measurements, how much area it took up, uh, so basically that they could, so that they could tax them and and, value, and put a value on it. Hence the word valuation. And Griffith was the person sort of in charge of that. So there are records um, of all of those. Those ex those exist. They didn't. Uh, the Griffith valuation records did not get wiped out in the 19, 
20s um, burning of the, the archives where we lost a lot of those early Irish censuses. Uh, but so they still exist. And for, when Martin, uh, he was he lived in a house that was owned by Thomas O'Donnell and you know, occupied a house and garden. And let's just take a, a closer look at that record. So that's what the record looked like. That's what it looked like basically in the document. So there's the, the tenant, Martin Rocket. Uh, Thomas O'Donnell was the landowner. I didn't have the, because his, his, his record was actually in the middle of the page. I don't have the, the headings there, um, but he had a house and a garden. And then we've got A, ARP 0317, and then we have pound shillings, pence, five, seven, 12. And basically the transcription or the translation of what that means is that uh, Martin was the tenant of Thomas O'Donnell in Killarney County Tipperary. Uh, his house and garden was assessed at a total of 12 shillings, five for the land and seven for the buildings. And the land measured 0A, 3R, and 17P. So I was with them up until that last line. I thought, what, this A, A, R, P, what's that all about? And really, that's it actually is a measure of area. Um, so, I mean, I knew that they were measuring area. So I guess that the A probably meant acres, and which is, in fact, true. So I looked look that up, and it actually stands for acres, roods and perches uh, hands up in the chat who know what uh roods and perches are uh, i think roods are probably related to rods but rods is a le uh, i believe rods is a linear measurement whereas these are all area measurements um and turns out there there are four roods in an acre and uh, uh four roods in an acre let's see and and 40 perches in a rood which is kind of a rude <laughs> calculation but yeah so four roods in an acre and then 40 perches in a rood uh, who comes up with this stuff i don't know but apparently um uh so if you want to convert it all to something that we're a little more familiar with the word acre then you would have to write that convert that to be uh, so zero acres, we don't have to worry about that. Three fourths of an acre plus 17 fortieths of a fourth of an acre, which gives you basically 137 one sixtieths of an acre, which if you think about it is about is a little over. Well, it's a little over three quarters of an acre, uh, three quarters and a half of an acre, three and a half quarters of an acre, something like that. But see, there's there's lots of there's lots of places where there's a, a lot of math and conversion and stuff. So very cool. Um, and that was from Griffith's valuation in Ireland. So I think I have come to the, uh, oh, one more screen. Uh, in the Hacktoberfest this year, Jamie uh, took her statistics app and updated it, added it to the tree apps. And then, um, uh, and then it was added to and more features were added to it. So there's a whole pile of statistics here and there's lots of cool math that we could delve into. But uh, I'm, I'm going to put a hold, a pause on that because we're going to be doing some wiki stats at the wrap up at uh, eight o'clock, eight o'clock my time, which is about two hours and a, two hours and 10 minutes from now. So uh, if you want stats in math, then you'll have to come back for the wrap up tonight in two hours and a bit. Okay. And I think that gets me to the end of my presentation. So I'm just leaving you with the message that math is everywhere and enjoy it while you do your genealogy. So, um, brain implodes. <laughs> um, I'm going to look through and see if there were any questions or comments or anything in the chat. If you have any now, you can throw them down. Um, otherwise, I will. Let's see. Hello, hello. Do, do, do. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, comments about Andy Gables. Yes, cool. Love this. Great. I like it too. Love the fan charts. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay thanks julie um and it is cool use the hypotenuse to find the ancestor that's it that's right uh oh the basics give me trouble as well that's funny um 
Glad you came. I'm glad you came too, uh, Joy. Uh, yeah, you're right. The radius could be variable depending on the text displayed. Yeah, um, I try in the fan chart. I did try to make it consistent, but um, when once you'll notice my example was where the everything was still in the sort of horizontal-ish orientation. I didn't go to the next one because that then I had to change the formula and all that. So I didn't want to get into those details. So uh, this is great. Uh, Murray says, I worked in an eph eph ephemeris charting software that used a lot of trig. Yes. Yeah. You can't do circles without doing some trig. Uh-huh. Circle graphs. Excellent. <laughs> Why? Why did I decide to watch this on my phone? That is a good question, Donna. You'll have to come back and watch it again on your laptop or computer uh, on YouTube. Uh, and yes, if you don't have zero difference matches, yes, that's hard. Uh, it is hard to find. Um, but if hopefully over time, more people will test and you'll get some, some matches. Uh, oh, I like this, Joy. Rudes eat all the perches at the Friday fish fry. <laughs> That's great. Mm. And there we go. And you're welcome. Uh, and you're welcome, Susie. Yeah, I thought I wanted, I wanted to take examples from as many apps as possible. Um, so I'm glad you enjoyed that. So um, thank you all very much for joining me tonight. And uh, there are still there's still some time for more WikiTree goodness um, over the Tech Trap um, Tech Track Tech Track. We will be doing the Hacktoberfest uh, wrap up and Appapalooza in eight minutes from now. So please join us over there and to watch that. Um, and I believe <laughs> I think Sandy's doing a different presentation, so you might want to go there. But um, come I'll, I'll come to the Hacktoberfest wrap up. And then uh, an, an hour after that, then Rob Pavey is doing a presentation on the Wikitree Sourcer app. And follow, following by in two hours and a bit will be the whole Wikitree uh, day wrap up and with a section on Wikitree stats. So thank you all for joining me tonight and have a great Wikitree day. Enjoy the rest of the presentations and I will see you around.